Good day, folks. So good to be here with you. Let me just say this right from the top. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, we are on the cusp of a new year. 2024 is just moments around the corner, if you will. And uh, it's really been a wonderful December here with the church and uh, with our families and uh, with my family. And I thank you that you would take time out of your day or places and spaces to uh, hear this message. And I pray that it would bless you. 37 years ago, January 1986 to be specific, American country music duo The Judds released a song by Jamie O'Hara called Grandpa, Tell Me About the Good Old Days. Maybe some of you would remember that song. A nostalgic country song where the singer feels overwhelmed by all the changes of modern life and, and wonders if things were better in your grandpa's days. And we see this wandering, wondering, this pondering as the singer sings, tell me about the good old days. Sometimes it feels like this world's gone crazy. Grandpa, take me back to yesterday when the line between right and wrong didn't seem so hazy. Then the singer goes on to ask some questions. Was a promise really something people kept? Not just something they would say. Did families really bow their heads to pray? Did daddies really never go away? Grandpa, let's wander back in the past and paint me a picture of long ago. Can I ask you a question? Do you ever find yourself remembering or reliving the past? I know I do sometimes. Now, Scott Harbord, uh, in one of his articles, addresses nostalgia, and he defines it this way. Quote, the wishful backward glance, the photo album of the mind, the string that, that tugs the heart from years gone by, the yearning to find a bridge across the canyon of time. And he recognizes, as we should, that looking back through the photo album of the mind, as he puts it, does have its good purposes. For example, nostalgia can remind us of the purposes of God in our lives in the past, and it could also be, as we look back, we could, we could have the voice of the Lord crying into the wilderness of our lives today. Yet for, for all the good reasons that nostalgia might uh, bring, Hubbard warns his readers in this particular article that, quote, nostalgia can also take a darker turn. For indeed, the tunnel of our memories can ever so quietly whisper with powerful emotive force, with powerful emotional strength, your best days are behind you. Your best days are behind you. Well, today we're going to be uh, in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 2. We're going to read the whole chapter. It's uh, 23 verses for context. So please join me uh, with your Bibles. Chapter, 20, uh, chapter 2 of Matthew's Gospel. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, behold, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when he rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, Bethlehem in Judea, for, this, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, 
gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not, not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by way of another. Verse 13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. Verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. This was fulfilled, what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea and Judah, Judea, Judah, Judea, pardon me, I just lost myself there for a second, was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this story that we have here in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2. Uh, the earliest days of Jesus and the events around all that. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to uh, understand this by your spirit, that you would illuminate the lessons that we need to learn from this and that we would be able to apply these to our own lives today wholeheartedly and that we would do so willingly and obediently to you, uh, obediently as well, Lord, to bring you all the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So folks, what we have here in this text is a narrative, a chronicling, a reporting, if you will, by Matthew concerning Jesus Christ. And Matthew began his reporting in the first chapter with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. We see that in the first 17 verses of chapter 1, and then he gives an abbreviated account of the birth uh, of Jesus. And Matthew now continued here in chapter 2 from the birth of Jesus Christ to recount the visit of the wise men from the east. We find these in verse 1 to 12, and then we go to Joseph when warned by an angel in a dream taking his family to Egypt, verse 13 to 18. And then upon the death of Herod, Joseph returning with his family to what was at the time a small Jewish village in Galilee called Nazareth. So our approach today will really be straightforward. We'll use the, uh, the interpretive uh, guide, KISS principle, keep it simple, sweetie. There's no need to get too complicated here. Uh, beginning with the visit of the wise men, that's where we'll start, and we'll deal with who's who in the zoo. And then we'll attempt to unpack ever so briefly, unfortunately, the relationship of the Old Testament prophecy with Matthew's narrative as well. And hopefully as we take this kind of approach, we can answer the important practical question, so what? What does Matthew's narrative of the birth and early days of Jesus have to do with you and me today? And even beyond you and me, what are the implications for the world around us? And how does this historical event that occurred over 2,000 years ago help us prepare for 2024? Well, with this in mind, let's take a look at the visit of the wise men here at verse 1 to 12. We notice right off the bat that geographical location of Matthew's event is obviously Jerusalem, and specifically, as verse 1 tells us, Bethlehem of Judea. I'll get that right. Judea, not Judah. Now, Bethlehem was the ancestral home of David, the king of Israel. We, we know that. 
and it was located six miles, and it is located six miles south of Jerusalem. In the time of Jesus' birth, uh, it was a small, unimportant village. Matthew also tells us that the visit of the wise men occurred after Jesus was born. We find this in verse 1. Now, for the curious-minded, we wonder how long after Jesus' birth was Matthew talking about? Well, my friends, best guesses abound. Commentators are here and there and everywhere with this. So the best we can do for today is to understand that the child with Mary, his mother, that we notice in verse 11, was likely somewhere between 6, maybe, to 18 months of age. However, we do know from history that Herod the king, that Matthew highlights here in verse 1, is indeed none other than Herod the Great. Now, more could be said about Herod the Great, but for those interested in timelines, the reign of Herod the Great ended upon his death approximately 4 BC. So merita, uh, Matthew's narrative, I'm having problems, boys and girls, hang in there. Matthew's narrative places Jesus' birth just before Herod's death mentioned in our text here at verse 19, but when Herod died. But now we want to spend some time looking at the tra travelers in the narrative, this, these wise men, verse 1 mentions. We can say with certainty that there has been and continues to be legends abound concerning these wise men. We see people saying, well, they were kings, and we sing, oh, three kings, oh, all that kind of stuff. And in our Christmas cards, we have them there at the birth of Jesus, at the manger, etc., etc. All sorts of stuff like that. But there is plenty of historical background available. But let's keep it simple, as I mentioned. That is the process today. In the days of the ancient Near East, which this was, the wise men Matthew points to would most likely have not been kings, but probably astronomers at the very least. And even the term wise men uh, can also be attributed to those who were interested in things like astrology or magic dreams and and uh, mysterious books and writings as well. So these wise men that we have here in the text plied their trade as philosophers and astrologers and astronomers and, and amongst many other things. And these wise men, according to Matthew, uh, came from the east, from the east, verse 1. Well, we can just simply call it the area that we call today where we find Iraq, Kuwait, Syria, and Turkey, those places in the east. So, here's the short and skinny. The wise men, plural, meaning historically more than three, traveling in a group, a contingent, to Judea from, e from the east as they followed his star. Do you notice the word his star? Whose star? Well, the answer is in verse 2, he who has been born king of the Jews. That's the baby Jesus, or Jesus. It's a child here now, not a baby. One can imagine these wise men uh, then stopping in the streets of Jerusalem and asking people this question, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? And that's, that's, that might have been interesting to hear these, these people asking for their help. But the story gets even more intriguing. It actually gets more darker. King Herod heard about these wise men, and the text tells us that he was troubled. And not only was he troubled, but it seems that all of Jerusalem was troubled along with him. Verse 3. But now we want to talk a little bit about King Herod. Again, historically, it seems that Herod was politically gifted and astute in, in politics. Apparently, he was a good administrator. He was admired by many for his building projects during his reign. For example, he um, did uh, some major work on the temple in Jerusalem. But this is the thing about Herod, King Herod, Herod the Great. He was power hungry. He loved power. And he was jealous to keep it at any expense. And again, we see this as the Roman emperor put King Herod uh, on the throne the first thing it says in history or tells us that he killed approximately 300 court officers right off the bat. Then he went on to murder his wife, Miriam, and her mother, Alexandra, his eldest son, Antipater, and two other of his sons, Alexander and Astrobulus. Astrobulus. 
So it's no wonder that after finding out from the chief priests and scribes where the Christ was born, verse 4, that he summoned these wise men from the east secretly and ascertained from them, the text tells us, the time the star had appeared. He was trying to figure out timings here. And then he sends them to Bethlehem to find that child and tells them a bunch of hogwash, I too, so that he would come and worship the child as well. Why? Well, here's his intentions. We find this in verse 16. Let's read that together. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all male children of Bethlehem and all the region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Now, this is shocking, and it should be. But when we think about Herod the Great, we think about what he, uh, his, uh, his desire for power and, and, and his actions concerning that. For Herod, the death of a few dozen children would be in keeping with that desire, for he was indeed an uh, evil king. And even in the larger culture of the day, probably didn't cause too much of a response. With this in mind, you might be saying, Pastor, well, we kind of jumped ahead of ourselves going to verse 16. Of course we have. But uh, what about Joseph and Mary and Jesus? What about the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Well, those are fair questions, but I I want us to go back again to the wise men. Let's go back to the wise men. And please notice what brought them to Bethlehem and to the house where they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Verse 11. What brought him there? It was his star. Verse 2. His star. Whose star? The star that led him to the one born king of the Jews. Jesus. So Matthew, my friends, couldn't be clearer. His star initially guided the wise men to the general area of Jerusalem. So it's no wonder the wise men went about Jerusalem asking questions. But did you notice here in the text that his star reappeared again another time? Even as Herod sent the wise men to Bethlehem to report back to him as they went on their way, the star that they had seen, that they had followed all the way from Iraq or Syria or or Turkey, rose again and came to rest over the place where the child was. Verse 9. So here's a good question to ask. Did these wise men have any knowledge of any of the prophets of the Old Testament? For example, Micah, concerning the prophecy of Bethlehem. Well, we can't be certain. And if there was a possibility, the only thing we would really be doing is speculating at best. And Matthew, writing his gospel under the superintending uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, makes no reference to this possibility, nor do the other gospel writers or anywhere in the New Testament. But we do know who knew. Well, it was the chief priests and scribes of verse 4 to 6. You see, these were the authorities on the Old Testament, and that's why King Herod went to them. They understood from the prophet Micah that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. And this is, of course, where Herod gathers information and tried to take out his threat to his rule, his perceived threat to his rule. My friends, this is where we intersect with the sovereign purposes of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ. This is where Old Testament prophecy confirms This is where Old Testament prophecy affirms New Testament events concerning the birth of the Messiah. Let me ask you another question. Would it surprise you that God would include a prophecy regarding the star the wise men followed through a wicked prophet? Well, he did. You go to Numbers chapter 22 to 24, and there you find the events in the person of the wicked prophet by the name of Balaam. You might know that story. And Balaam prophesied in chapter 24, verse 17, and said, I see him now, I behold him, but not near, a star shall come out of of Jacob. So what was Matthew doing here? What was he pointing out? Well, that God guided these astronomers, astronomers, these wise men, by a star as a fulfillment of Numbers 24, 17. Which, of course, was regarded by the chief priests and scribes of the day as a messianic prophecy, prediction. It's also very interesting to note that the very ones who knew the exact place of the birth of Messiah did nothing, and the wise men from afar followed a star provided by God to do what? What did they go there to do? To worship him, verse 2 tells us. Worship who? The child with Mary, verse 1. 
Therefore, while the text tells us that these wise men offer the child Jesus gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, verse 11, Matthew's contrast between Herod, the chief priests, and scribes and the wise men could not be more obvious to the reader, to you and me. You see, Herod hated any challenge to his power and therefore was hostile to Jesus and wanted to take him out. The chief priests and scribes were simply apathetic toward Jesus. But the wise men, they worshipped Jesus at a great cost and a great effort. Someone once said, quote, Those who look for Jesus will see him, and those who truly see him will worship him. And we find that those who do worship Jesus authentically, as the wise men worship Jesus, they demonstrate obedience. And we see this in verse 12 with the wise men. And being warned in a dream not returned to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. See, these wise men were no stool pigeons for a power-hungry puppet king. These wise men were servants of God and his son, Jesus Christ. Well, let's go back to our narrative. As the wise men, according to verse 12, departed to their own country by another way, we find that here in verse 13, that an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take this child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And Joseph, as he did in chapter 1, uh, wasted no time and was obedient to this uh, dream and this, this message from the Lord. And uh, he took the child, it says in verse 14, and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. And according to Matthew, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son, verse 15. Matthew there, quoting uh, the prophet Hosea, chapter 11, verse 1. And we just momentarily, uh, um, a few moments ago, I mean, spent some time with Herod's response to these events. He became furious. He killed all the male children in the region two years old or younger. You see that in verse 16. And this, we are told by Matthew, was another fulfilled prophecy. And this one from the prophet Jeremiah, we see this in verse 18. They're alluding to Jeremiah, verse 31, verse 15. And then Matthew transitions from the heartbreak of Herod's evil jealousy to Joseph and his fam family waiting for the a word that Herod had died so they could return to Israel. Well, word came. Didn't come by email, by text, phone call, evening news, smartwatch, but from an angel of the Lord, verse 19 and 20. An angel of the Lord who appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And again, Joseph was obedient and took his family and made, his, made their way to uh, Israel. And along the way, Joseph found out that Herod's son was reigning over Judea, and then again, another visitation from God, warned in a dream, withdrew to the district of Galilee, verse 22, to a city called Nazareth. Again, Matthew reminds us that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 23, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now we could say so much more about this text, but we have it here in a nutshell. We have Matthew's account of the birth in the earliest days of Jesus Christ. My friends, it's a real story of a family and an evil king and blind and indifferent religious leadership and travelers from afar bringing gifts to a child king of the Jews. Friends, it's a real story in a real place in real time. And most of all, the story, and most of all, the story is the story of all human time, human history, all of human all of eternity past, pardon me, present and future, it's all about that. It's also a real story of spiritual warfare. You see the ancient foe Satan via his human agents scheming to take out the holy child. It's, yet it seems, no, it is true. Satan, his human agents, wicked prophets of old, ruthless kings and emperors are seemingly servants of God. For God sovereignly, my friends, according to his redemptive purposes, dispatching the angels, speaking to his chosen ones in dreams, and through real-time events, fulfilling his promises one by one. And the greatest promise of all that he fulfilled 
was concerning the Messiah of God, his son, Jesus Christ. So we can ask now the practical question, so what? What are we to do with the Old Testament prophecies? There's four of them. Angelic warnings, there's four of them. With the wise men from the east with their gifts. With all of this. And in a few hours the calendar will turn and 2023 will be in the books, never to be repeated. A new year will be given to us by God himself. 12 months, 366 days. And because 2024 is a leap year, we will have another 8,700 in 84 hours. Let me ask you a question. Will you start the new year with the attitude that your best days are behind you? Your best days are behind you? My friends, the wisdom of Solomon would advise against this kind of thinking, for it would be foolishness. Solomon said, Say not, why were former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 10. My friends, Hubbard was right, quote, For all the wonders of yesterday, the past is not always what we remember. Human memory does not tell objective history, though we often assume otherwise. Indeed, the past contains good memories, happy memories, good lessons. But friends, let's don't forget the thorns and the bushes. You know, swimming in sentimentality will take us absolutely nowhere. And worse yet, the tunnels of our memories may blind us even to our present blessings. And let us pause now as we just about transition into a new year, the cusp of a new year, and consider how God has blessed us in so many ways, how God has blessed you in so many ways. And consider with me the greatest gift God has given all of us and the world. He gave us himself. Just as before he ascended, he said to his disciples, and by extension to you and me today, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 20. So friends, as we look beyond toward the new year, we don't know what the future will hold for us. But as sons and daughters of God, we know who holds the future. You know, God in his sovereign purposes, through his prophets and his kings, his people, the good, the bad, and the ugly, sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, into a world that didn't recognize him and even didn't want him. Why? To fulfill his redemptive purposes. Dear friends, we can rest in God's goodness and grace and loving purposes concerning our past, our present, and future. Remember that this child in chapter 2 would grow up, and the writer to Hebrews would remind us that he would grow up for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Apostle Paul understood that his past and present propelled him forward into the future. Paul said, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 14. May we run into 2024 likewise. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time together. Will you take it? Will you move it in our hearts, from our hearts to our feet and hands? And all this for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. One more time. Happy New Year to each and every one of you. God bless. Shalom.